Good evening once again to this third and final part being on the series of the third angel's message, righteousness by faith and victory over sin. Righteousness by faith and victory over sin. Amen. In the third and final part of the series of the third angel's message. I pray you be blessed by this evening's um, study as we are already at the close of the Sabbath and I pray that that you have your Bibles with you. If not, may you take heed to what your Spirit, what the Holy Spirit saith unto us, as we have already entered to the close of the Sabbath and the beginning of a new week before us. Amen. And with that being said, let us all have a word of prayer and then we'll begin on our study. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us as you do on this very crucial topic, which many of us, your people, neglect to study and to understand, even to experience. And thus, we neglect to thoroughly prepare ourselves for these last days and that we'll get ready, get ready, and get ready. Lord, there is no other way in which we can prepare ourselves in the last days um, other than studying righteous by faith and virtue over sin and experience practically these very crucial topics. Besides studying your words, besides studying about Bible prophecy and about the health message, Lord, these two things are very important for our salvation. Otherwise, you will not be saved, for these things reveal unto us perfectly Jesus Christ. I believe more than all the other things which your word tells us. Help us, Lord. May we understand these things not just theoretically, but that we will practically apply these things in our daily lives. That we truly prepare ourselves for these last days, and even now. I pray that everything that shall be spoken and taught be according to your word and that will be edified and be strengthened to move forward in your name, drawing closer into thee and putting away our sins and start making full surrender unto Christ. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, first of all, to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 as a deal on our study dealing on righteous by faith and bridge over sin and how these two important topics are connected together they're because these two things even though they appear to be different are one the same they have one goal one end game and they both go hand in hand together and they cannot be separated it is impossible for us to separate righteous by faith from victory over sin if we do that we will neither experience either one, neither righteous by faith nor do over sin, and yea, not even abiding in Christ. Therefore, it's very really important that we understand these two things and that and how how they are connected together, and how we can be be better be better prepared to receive the seal of God and to not receive the mark of the beast. And this is, I believe, the full important object behind the third angel's message and that is righteous by faith and the commandments of God because verse 12 of Revelation chapter 14 says here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus amen now let's deal first of all on righteous by faith and they will then we'll deal on victory over sin and, and once we understand the link that is between these these two then we will better understand how we can prepare ourselves to not receive the mark of the beast and that we may, we may re receive the seal of the living God. Amen. Let's deal first of all on faith, then on righteousness, and what is a true understanding of these two things. First of all, let's deal on faith. Let's deal on chapter 11 of, of the book of Hebrews, starting verse number 1. Why don't, why don't text to many of us? Let's just read verse number 1. Hebrews 11 verse number 1 says this, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if we stop right there. So now Paul is saying to us that, first of all, the definition of faith, that faith is a substance. It is, in other words, matter. Like this table right here, this is matter. This is something that, that is um, something that you can touch. It is tangible, something that you can feel. That's what a substance is, something that you can feel and something that you can even um, even hold on to or even knock like I'm doing right now. That's, so that's what a substance is and that's what faith is. Like into a substance of things hoped for, 
but it is also the evidence of things not seen. And many of us well know this definition that is both the substance, something that is tangible. Now, faith is not something that you can see, but something that you can exper experimentally and practically feel, something that you can apply to your daily life. But there's also the evidence of things not seen or something of things that are not seen with a naked eye, something that, that is not easily understood, such as God, his, um, his creative power, and also um, his power as demonstrated in all nature throughout the entire planet Earth, which are his and which he has created by his own word and by his own power. So it is the, the substance and the evidence. When we have faith in the Lord, that in itself is evidence that God is doing a work in us through his Holy Spirit, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But this is not all of what faith is. Because when you truly, frankly ask the question, what is faith? Many of us will have a very difficulty in understanding what faith really is. Now we may know the definition of faith as says in verse number one, but we don't dig deep as to how is it that that faith is a substance. Now that is something which, which many of us really ask. What, how is it that faith is a substance and how is it that it is evidence? So we need to be very, very careful how that we need to dig deep into this faith. And it's not any one's faith that we, are, that we are to have, but it is the faith of Jesus. Now, now let's dig deep. What really is faith? It's not, it's not just a substance or an evidence. There is more into it, more than meets the eye. Amen? And we're going to go, go to a clear example of it, just an illustration of, of what faith really is, so that we may better understand what, how it is a substance and evidence. Amen? So hold... Hebrews chapter 11 with your Bible marker. And let's go quickly to the book of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And I have to put this out to you. When you look at the ministry of Christ and the, the, and the, um, the miracles that Christ had done, nearly all, of his para, nearly all his miracles that he had done during his three and a half year ministry to the people in his time in Jerusalem gives us a clear understanding of of righteous by faith, justification by faith, as well as victory over sin. Of all, of everything that he had done, these very things, these actions, these miracles and the perils that he spoke, they were all demonstration and even illustrations by word and in action of, how, of what really is righteous by faith and victory over sin. Amen? And we're going to one of them, and that is in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse number five matthew eight from verse five and onward uh, we can just jot down to verse number nine so matthew chapter eight from verse five to verse number nine it reads this and when jesus was entered into capernaum there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying <clears throat> excuse me and saying lord my servant life at home sick of the palsy Grievously tormented. Now verse number seven. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. This is what Christ um, promised and even um, even said to the centurion, I will come and heal him. So we see how that so we see right here that Christ is about to do a work of miracle as he sees this centurion beseeching Christ to heal his servant that was grievously tormented. And we're sick of the palsy, but there is something else that brought into play that really blew the mind of Christ in his humanity. And this is something that, that really, as it says there, marveled him. That caused him to marvel, like surprise, like this is this is really happening. Let's read on. Verse number eight. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Now verse number nine, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goeth, and to another, and to another come and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. So now the centurion um, places 
um, before Christ, this simple analogy comparing his work and his authority, his office as a centurion, um, a, a, a captain over 100 Roman soldiers, to the authority and power of Christ himself, the creator of the world and the savior of mankind. So in other words, he was saying, just as my soldiers that are under me recognize my authority as supreme, and they do according to all that I command them, even so you, Lord, are the commander of the universe, you are the savior of mankind, and by thy word, all these things, all your creatures obey thy word. So you see, this, you see the connection right here? So, so again, I'm going I'm to repeat it. Just as I, the Roman centurion, am in charge and I command my soldiers to do according to my word, even so you, Lord, are under the authority of God, and you command all your creatures to do according to your will, and they obey your voice. You command the disease to depart, and they depart. You heal the sick. You, you command the word of healing, and the healing takes place. And when Christ saw that, as it says there in verse number 10, he marveled. And that caused him to say that I have not found such great faith, no, not in all Israel. So here, a clear example, a deep understanding about what faith is. In verse number eight, it really gave itself, even though it doesn't say the word faith, it says, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So, so you say, Lord, there's no need for you to come into my house because I'm not worthy. In other words, he's, he's acknowledging that he's a sinner, and that he's in need of a savior as well as his servant, who is in a, in a physical torment, in a, in a deep sickness. And, that, and also that by his physical healing, he himself, the centurion, will be spiritually healed from whatever that was really holding him down. Because he said, I am not worthy, even though he had done a very great work, a good work for the Jews in building them a synagogue. As it says in chapter 8, I believe, in the book of Luke. The Pharisees said he loves our nation and he, and he had built us a synagogue. They said he is worthy. He, he, he is a good centurion unlike all the other Romans. He loves us. He built us a church where we can do our church service. But the, the centurion said, no, I am unworthy. So we see here a contrast between God's repressed people who claim to be his commandment keepers and yet they themselves are doing righteousness by works, but not righteous by faith. Unlike, while well, the other hand, you have this Gentile who works for the for the heathen government, Rome, pagan Rome at that time, who was doing righteousness by his faith in the power of Christ. Speak the word only. I don't need to see any outward miracle right before my face. So that way I can believe you, but I want you to speak the word only. And I believe and I have faith in that word that would do what you have promised to do. That right there is faith. Faith is the expecting of the word of God that it will accomplish what it has promised to do, as well as the depending or the relying on the word of God that it will accomplish what it has promised to do. That right there is the faith that we must have, yea, even the faith of Jesus. And this is what blew the mind of Christ. And even what will blow the minds of many of, of those that profess godliness, that have only a form but deny the power thereof, it will blow their minds as well. And it, but not only that, it will also be a rebuke to them. Because they do not believe in the power of God, but we that are called and chosen, that, we, that whom we realize that, that we ourselves are sinners and that we need of a savior, that we can do nothing in our own strength to overcome sin, and that there's no righteousness, no good thing in our flesh, in our bodies, and, what, and that we come unto God, seeking for a confession of sin and forgiveness, and the, and the close of his righteousness, and we demonstrate in reality the power of godliness, that all these things are a rebuke unto them. 
They'll be like, wow, really? This is how the, that this is that these things are done. It's it's going to blow their minds, and just like what it did with Christ in His humanity, because He did not expect such a faith, such as that, unlike the faith of the Jews, who really did not believe in the power of Christ, and who did not believe in Him as Messiah and the Son of God, the the very ones whom He came to save. So you see how that, you see the clear understanding about faith, how that once this faith is head on to and, it, and held constantly in the individual, that's going to free himself from many of the heartaches and troubles that will, that will wait in his path if he hold on to, hold on unto unbelief. This is very important for us that we hold on to this faith that is once delivered unto the saints, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, amen? So this right here is faith. And this is how that faith is the substance. This is how it can be tangible in our lives and this is how it can be the evidence of things that are not clearly understood and not really seen with a naked eye that really, which finite minds, which our finite minds cannot really perfectly comprehend concerning the things that are not seen not perfectly understood written in the word of god and even in the things in heaven amen now let's turn back to hebrews chapter 11 hebrews chapter 11 and we can now look in verse number six verse number six is very important and crucial because if we disregard this admonition verse number six we will not truly have faith and we will, and we will not even increase in faith. Amen. Verse number six of Hebrews chapter 11. You can turn back there. I pray you had your Bible marker marked there to save it, to save the page. It reads, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. This is how that faith is to motivate us. It's not, it's not that just to say, I believe in the power of God, and therefore I can just sit, do nothing, and just believe. And that's what many of us, I'm sure, have um, as Christians. We have this mentality, this belief system, that all we can do is, is just believe but not at, but not have any action just believe and you'll be okay not so friends this, this, is, this is not how that faith is to be this faith is not an idle faith it is a working active faith a living working active faith once we have this faith what is it to do it's not just it's just to sit and lie in our minds and we just just sit and wonder and saying, okay, I now I accept it by God. Oh, I believe in the, in the word of God. I'll just sit and just, and just do nothing and I'll be okay. No, you will return back unto sin. Return back onto iniquity, back onto backsliding. You'll backslide into worldliness, to iniquity. That's very dangerous very dangerous so again verse number six he that coming to god must believe that he is that he is the great i am that he is the same god yesterday today and forever that he is the same god who can empower us to live his life and that we can follow christ and that we can overcome sin that is the god that we serve the god who was promised and his promises will not fail and whose word will not return unto him void. As God has spoken his word, his word will, his word will be accomplished. But if we do not believe in that word by this faith, there will be no benefit to our spirituality and will not increase in faith, will not increase in our spiritual walk with Christ. Amen? Always remember that. So that's number one, he that, that he must believe that, that God is. And number two, that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. 
So now what else? You must not only believe that he is, but you must diligently seek the Lord in earnest prayer, in Bible study, and in self-examination. Self-examination. We're told from Gospel Workers, page 100, that we must guard jealously our hours of prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. And that's once we commune with God in His Word, day by day, especially in this in the portion of the day in which we set aside for prayer, Bible study, and self-examination, our spiritual strength will be increased and we'll grow more into the, in favor with God. Receiving the spiritual energy that we need day by day, every morning, evening at noon. Amen? It's very important. We must digitally see the Lord. And that in itself is a work. Now, works in general, that word work is, is become the most, I should say, the most vulgar word in Seventh-day Adventism. A dirty, vulgar word in Seventh-day Adventism, works. Saying, oh, you have works? Oh, you must work? You must work your own salvation, fear, and trembling? Oh, no, that's Roman Catholicism. You must just have faith, and that's it. That's error. It's not just to have faith. You must have works, because faith without works is dead being alone. You understand that? That's, 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 that's exactly what James said. In James chapter 2, faith without works is dead being alone. And works perfectly demonstrate that we have the faith of Jesus and that this faith is alive within our hearts. As a matter of fact, let's turn there. You can close Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. As we move on onto the clear understanding about faith and how it is to work in our lives, and our walk with Christ, as well as in our spiritual growth. Keep James chapter 2, and let's start reading verse number 17, which I quoted. He, James chapter 2 and verse 17 reads this. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, is it just any works in general? No, it's it's a specific work, specific works that which God wills that we perform, and that is the works of confessing our sins unto Christ, First John chapter one verse one, that we've confessed our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and also forsaking our sins. That is the most difficult work which many of us find very hard to do. Proverbs chapter 20 says that if we cover up our sins, meaning hold on to sin, we will not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confessing and forsaking sin are the works which we must, only by the grace and the power of God, perform. Otherwise, our faith will be, will be weakened, it will be dead, and we will be spiritually atrophied, the wasting away of our spiritual muscles from our vessels, if we do not have a, a living, working faith. Amen? And let's read on. Verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You can be a devil. You know that? I can be a devil. I can be Satan. Believing and trembling at the word of God, and yet do nothing to reform myself. Nothing. I mean, look at Satan. Satan is, is, is the most the most powerful and diligent Bible student than many of us, than even myself. A very diligent Bible student, but is he sanctified by the Word of God? He is not. He is still Satan. He is still the devil. He is still evil. Doing his insidious work. And the same thing that we can we can do as well. We can be a diligent Bible student. We may even memorize scripture. We can quote scripture from memory. We can re recite scripture. We can dress handsome, sharp, good, nice on Sabbath, going to, ch to church every Sabbath, giving your tithes and offerings, and you may appear to be good. But that does not mean that you are of Christ. 
that does not mean that you are body in Christ. That just simply means that you're just having a form of godliness, and yet you are a living devil in God's church. Let's pause that for a moment to seek to seek that down. You understand that? Walking devils that have no God in their lives. And that's what many of us are. That's what many of us are. We just have faith, but we have not works. We might we do not have this clear evidence that make the faith of Jesus clear evidence that we are his and that we are not of the world. There must be a clear distinction between God's true people and those that are in the world, those that do not serve God in spirit and truth. Amen? So, this faith, again, I'm going to recite, in case you, if you just for, um, forgot, that faith is the depending on the Word of God and the, and the, um, the expecting on the Word of God. They will accomplish what they have promised to do. That is faith. And once... And once this is perfectly done in our lives, this clearly shows that this faith is clearly the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance and the evidence. But is that all that we need to have? Just just this faith? No. We mu there must be also be works that demonstrate that we have faith in God and that God is our only trust that we do not trust in our in our feeble strength which is but weakness that we don't trust in our own righteousness which are but filthy rags but we trust in the mighty power of jesus christ who is our righteousness because christ clearly demonstrates to us what faith is and what righteousness is by his miracles his ministry and what he had done throughout his righteous life and throughout his ministry and even by his his death on the cross of Calvary his his ultimate sacrifice he had offered for our redemption and to enable us to obey the law of God and to follow his word and that we may be reconciled unto God that we may be born again and experience righteous by faith and bridge over sin amen it's very important that we understand these things so so, so now to wrap this up, we have this faith and we have works that demonstrate that or that perfects our faith in us. To clarify that, take heed to what James chapter 2 says in verse number 22. It reads, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, talking about Abraham, and by works was faith made perfect? So by works, faith is made perfect perfect not 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 legalistic works this is not the works that james is talking about not legalistic works we do not work to be reconciled unto god we, we don't do that 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 right there is faithlessness oh we must um just afflict our bodies and just tear up our literal clothes we um literally throw dust and ashes upon our heads and our faces we um like what, what the roman Catholics do even in the days of the reformers, what they had done under the reign of the Roman Catholic Church during the Dark Ages, we must afflict our bodies, we must do all these works, all these good works, the, the works of the law, because of the penalty of the law, that by doing all these things, we can be reconciled unto God. That is not the works that we are to do, because if we just have these works, which really do not perfect faith, we are dead spiritually, and our faith is dead. Those are the works which we are not to perform in which Paul himself condemned in the book of Romans, especially in Romans chapter 4. The works which we are to do is none other, none other than the works of righteousness, even righteousness itself, because righteousness is right doing, doing what is right. That in itself is works. But we must dig deep into what righteousness is as we make now the transition. So we understand what faith is and how is we run in our lives. So now we need to understand what righteousness is. Amen. 
what really is righteousness? Take notice what um, the prophet of the Lord, Elijah White, says in the book of Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 18. Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 18. Amen? Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing in page number 18. And you can read this in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6, that says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now take take notice what Sister White said in page 18 of Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing. Amen. Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. 1 John 4, verse 16. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Verse 172. And love is a fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, verse 10. And righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Christ. Did you catch that? We receive righteousness by receiving Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. So this faith of Jesus is what brings about this true righteousness, which is found only in Christ. So let's so let's bring this all together. Let's build up this um this um these blocks of the building, as it were. So the origin of faith, when you read Romans chapter 10 in verse number 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God is preached unto you unto your ear, unto unto you. You hear the word of God being preached, and that hearing is what brings about the faith. Faith comes by hearing. So now you have faith in the word of God that it will do a work which you yourself cannot do in your own strength. So you have this faith, and once you have this faith or this belief on the word of God that will come to do what I promise to do, you now call upon him. Verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, his character, his work, his power, for him to be del delivered and from sin, his taskmaster, he shall be saved. And that's why Christ was named Jesus. And he shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. And this is what this faith is. And faith is perfected by doing the works of confessing and forsaking our sins by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God. Amen? So now you have this faith, but what is... Brings a, what brings about as a result of having this faith of Jesus? It is his righteousness. And that is the perfection of the Christian character. Souls have not done, but Christ had done. And which we clearly see within his word and within his own life. Do you understand that? Hey, Amen? Because if you do, put hearts on the screen. Because it's very important that we understand how that righteousness is to work perfectly in our lives. When we look at Christ, his righteousness and his glory, his character, we see our own imperfections, our own weakness. We are see ourselves as sinners and in need of a savior. And we see Christ holy and pure as he is and Christ hang upon the cross of Calvary, dying for our sins, for our transgressions. And we, like Isaiah, in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, we say, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And once we confess our, our sins unto Christ, what, what shall he do? Once he sees our work of accepting the merits of Christ and believing in his power that we can overcome sin and live his life, what does he do? Does he, does he cast us away? No. He accepts us as he is once we come unto him as we are. And he clothes us with his righteousness once we give unto him our filthy rags. He takes those things from us. He takes away our sins. 
the burdens of sin, cast them onto the desert of the sea, and he clothes us with his righteousness, his purity alone, that makes us one with him. He And he justifies us. He makes us righteous. He declares us as righteous, declares us as just, and declares us as now his own, his children being born again. Amen? Being born again. Let me read on it in page 18 of Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing. Now in paragraph number two. Not by painful struggle, struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Without money and without price, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah 55 verse 1, chapter 54 verse 17, and Jeremiah 23 verse number 6. And that's from the Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page number 18. This is what righteousness is. And this is the only righteousness which we are to close ourselves with. We need to stop worrying on the filthy rags that makes our body filthy. And, make, and thus making our lives unclean. Still. Amen. His righteousness is the only clothing and the only armor that we need to arm ourselves and close ourselves with. Because without his righteousness, we shall continue to sin and transgress the law of God. Amen. Now let's close James chapter 2 and turn me to the book of Revela Revelation chapter 3. Chapter 3 of Revelation is where we go to next. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse number 18. The same counsel that he has given to, to the church of Laodicea, that's that's to us, God's people, um, said they about the church, and he counsels us th this these three things which I um, um, suggest that all of you study and search out for yourself, the three things which we must have that make us one to Christ, not just his raiment, but also the gold trying to fire, and number three, the eye self that we may see. But our focus is on the garments, the pure white garment that he spoke of. Chapter 18, verse, verse number 18 of chapter 3 of Re Revelation, we will read. It reads, I counsel thee, Laodicea, to buy me gold, trying to fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So this righteousness is that same white raiment that we must clothe ourselves with. That the nakedness of sin and the deformity of sin may no longer be may no longer be seen in us. Amen. This is the white raiment that we are to be clothed with. Now, what does it mean to be clothed with, with Christ's righteousness? Yes, we know that his clothing, the white raiment, is for his righteousness. But what does it really mean to be clothed with his righteousness? Let's read. Um, let's read. This is page 311 of the book called Christ's Object Lessons. Christ's Object Lessons, page number 311. Amen. Page number 311 of Christ's Object Lessons is what I'll read in, you, in your hearing. What does it mean to be clothed with his righteousness? It's very important to understand that. It reads, This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ, in his humanity, wrought out a perfect character. And this character he offers to impart to us. All our unrighteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6. Everything we are of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins. In Him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law. 1 John 3 verses 5 and 4. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. 
He said of himself, I delighted to thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse number 8. When on earth he said to his disciples, I have kept my father's commandments, John 15, verse 10. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. You hear many of us say, you hear people say, oh no, you can't overcome sin. You will sin until, until Jesus comes. Is that really true? No. Look at Christ. You make Christ a liar if you say that. You say that you can't overcome sin and you can't obey God's law. That is impossible to keep his commandments, to conform to the, to the law of God. Is it really possible? It is possible, but the, but the problem is that we do not believe in the power of God. We do not believe in Christ. And because of this unbelief, we will be shut out from the heavenly Canaan land, the new Jerusalem, and we will eventually receive the mark of the beast. Always remember that. Amen? Now read on. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one of his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. Let me read that again. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. Number one. Number two, the will is merged in his will. Number three, the mind becomes one of his mind. Number three, I'm sorry, number four, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him. And number five, we live his life. Are we doing these things once you submit ourselves unto Christ? What is the result? What This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. So here's the answer. So when we submit ourselves unto Christ, the mind becomes one of his mind, our thoughts are brought into captivity to him, and the will is merged unto his will, we live his life, and so on. We are clothing ourselves with his righteousness. And we and thus we are united with Christ and we are abiding in Christ. And this is one of the leading factors, or should I say the, the main factor for us to overcome sin, which I'll deal with in, in the last section to close out the message. Amen. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and the deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. So now we look into victory over sin. So once we have submitted ourselves unto Christ and we've given all, surrendered all unto Christ. And thus we be, we clothe ourselves with his righteousness. Now we are we, now and we and, and we are abiding in him. We are, by the grace and the power of God, enabling ourselves to overcome sin. And what is this main element? That helps us to overcome sin and that is our faith what is it it is our faith this is the victory that overcomes the world to confirm that turn with me to the book of first john chapter 5. first john chapter 5. first john chapter 5. first john chapter 5 verse number 4. for whatsoever is born of god overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And verse number five, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So once we have, we have the experience of being born again and believing that Christ is the Son of God, not just believing his divinity per se, but believing in his power that we can overcome sin, that we can live his life just as he himself had done, who had done, done no sin, we live his life and we overcome sin by the word. And who is the word? It is Jesus. It is he who has overcome the world and it is he that empowers us to overcome sin and to do the will of God and to keep his law. And this is what 
we are to experience to prepare ourselves to not receive the mark of the beast and to receive the seal of the living God as God's true Sabbath-keeping people, his covenant-keeping people. It's one thing for us to, to, to understand the, about the mark of the beast and the difference between the seventh day Sabbath and the seal of God. Amen? There, and it's one thing for us to understand about Bible prophecy, tw about the 2300 days and so on. We may know all of that, but we're not overcoming sin if we don't have the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith in Jesus and of Jesus, we will not be saved and we will, we will ultimately receive the mark of the beast for the sake of being one with the world instead of being one with, with Christ. And I, and I beseech all of you that into myself as well, that we take heed to God's word, that we take heed to the third angel's message, that once we have done all and surrounding all unto Christ, that Christ will say of us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Those who have conformed unto the law of God and have kept it by, by the faith of Jesus, they're the ones that will be among the, the 144,000 and they will be the ones that shall receive the seal of God in their foreheads, having their Father's name written in their foreheads. Do you want to be saved? I don't know about you, but I want to be saved into God's kingdom and be, be a part of the 144,000. Amen? Let us take heed lest we fall. Be blessed. And to close off this message, let's, let, I want us to sing in, in your hearing in hymn number 309 in the first stanza in the last stanza of I Surrender All. I surrender all hymn number 309 and we're going to sing the first stanza and the last so may you be blessed by this song to let the words sink down in your mind and your ears amen through zero nine one two three all to jesus i surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender, I surrender. surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Four stanza. All to Jesus I surrender, now I feel the sacred flame, all the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to his name. I surrender, I surrender all, I surrender, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Now let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that we have heard from thee, which you have spoken to us in plain, simple language. We ask that we will not forget these things, but that we will take heed to what we have heard. And as we enter into this new week before us, may we draw closer unto thee, submit on to thee, surrender on to Christ, and that our thoughts, our motives, and our actions, and our thoughts be one with his, and that our thoughts are in captivity unto Christ and that we live his life and thus be clothed his righteousness and no longer ours which are but filthy rags. 
Please, Lord, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and may you strengthen us each day to draw closer unto you, to do your will, and that we obey all the truth, and thus be sanctified through thy truth, for thy word is truth. We thank you for hearing, answering, and may you let the words of our mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless all of you, and I wish you all a good evening and a good night rest, and, I'm, and by God's grace we will meet again at the time appointed according to, the, to, to God's own time. God bless and Maranatha. The Lord is coming.